Welcome to the bridges between Columbia and Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. This is a small pictorial history of the six bridges that crossed the Susquehanna River from Columbia on the east side to Wrightsville on the west side. These bridges opened the way for settlers to have an easier way than the ferry to cross the river and head west. Some of the text in this video is from a partial transcript written for the broadcaster newspaper in the years 1933 and 1934. This will be so noted. The first bridge was the longest covered bridge in the world. It was 5,690 feet long, 30 feet wide. It opened for travel in 1814. It was destroyed by ice in February 1832, and it stood on 28 stone piers and was located approximately one quarter of a mile above the Veterans Memorial Bridge, Route 462. The remains of the piers can only be seen when the river is extremely low. This bridge cost $231,171 to build. The only pictures of the first bridge are artist conceptions because this was long before photography. The ferry at Columbia had been established in doing a profitable business for a period of 80 years. Then there arose a public demand for a bridge across the Susquehanna. The ferry had been a rather uncertain quantity in both extremely high water as well as low water. The crossing being difficult in the rapid current at flood stage and in very low water, the boats would become grounded upon the many ledges of rocks. Due to the increasing traffic westward, the legislature of Pennsylvania early in 1811 passed an act authorizing the governor to incorporate a company for the purpose of erecting a bridge across the Susquehanna River at the town of Columbia. Commissioners were appointed to receive subscriptions to the capital stock, which though large for those days, was placed at $400,000. The general public was skeptical as this bridge was to be larger than most existing bridge in the world. And it was not until November the 19th, 1811, that the commissioners were able to report that $120,000 had been subscribed which together with $90,000, which the Commonwealth had agreed to take under the act, made funds enough to at least start the project of building the bridge. The bridge was to be built at a point about 400 yards above the present railroad bridge, the end being at the upper end of the basin or at a point opposite Linden Street. The bridge was to be built upon stone piers 40 feet long and 10 feet wide and 20 feet above low water mark. The construction of the bridge was started, but as the cost ran ahead of the estimates and some of the subscribers failed to make good their pledges, the money ran out before the job was completed. And in order to save the project from failure, the directors decided to form, in connection with the bridge company, a general banking company. The resulting company became known as the Columbia Bank and Bridge Company. And after 25 years of combined operation, the directors found that the interests of the bank were jeopardized by the risky nature of the bridge company. With the same directorate, and the Columbia Bank became the ancestor of the present first National Columbia Bank. The bridge was finally completed in 1814. It was 5,600 feet long on 53 piers and cost $231,000. After the construction and opening of the first bridge across the Susquehanna, the business of the ferry dwindled away to a minimum, it being much more convenient to drive across the bridge than to trust one's team to the uncertainty of the ferry boat. The bridge did a thriving business as there was a large amount of western travel and the railroad was not yet established. All commodities were hauled by teams and all cattle were driven afoot. The year of 1831 and 32 was a severe one. The ice froze on the river to a thickness of 20 inches. On February 20, 1832, 
There was a sudden thaw and heavy rains upstate, which raised the river to flood stage and broke up the ice. The ice gorged across the islands just below Columbia, forming a natural dam 30 to 40 feet high, and the resulting backwater rose to a height of 20 feet above low water mark. All the warehouses along the river were flooded, as were all the cellars on Front Street, and some parts of the street were covered with three feet of water. This flood was too much for the first bridge, which was not very high above the water, even at normal times, and the backwater lifted it bodily off its piers and carried it upstream, where in the jam of ice, it was broken to pieces. The Columbia Bank and Bridge Company immediately took steps as to build a new and more elaborate bridge. It was decided to abandon the old location which ran across the lower end of Big Island and to place the new structure closer to the centers of both Columbia and Wrightsville. Accordingly, the spot chosen was from a point opposite the Brick Ferry House on Front Street, Columbia, to the foot of Helm Street, Wrightsville, which was the York Pike. The site was the same as that occupied by the old railroad bridge and part of the piers used were the same that was built in 1834 for the second bridge. The bridge was 40 feet wide, 5,620 feet long and was built on heavy stone piers, 15 feet high above the water mark. There were two towing paths, one higher than the other, on the lower side of the main bridge. These were used by horses in towing canal boats across the river and were so designed that the tow rope of the team going one way would pass over the heads of the team going the other way. The bridge was built of heavy white pine timbers having the Howell Truss arch construction and the whole thing including the tow paths was roofed over with split wide pine shingles. Well in November of 1834 Double railroad tracks were laid across the bridge, connecting Wrightsville with the Columbia and Philadelphia Railroad. This bridge, like the first one, carried much traffic, both railroad and canal, and untold thousands of pedestrians who had a special walk trod its plank floor. This is part of the transcript aforementioned. The arrows point to the remains of the first bridge. They can only be seen in extremely low water. The following two pictures were taken from the Route 30 bridge in August of 1991. This bridge had a double towpath to allow the canal boats to be pulled towards both sides of the river at the same time. This bridge was also a covered bridge. It was 5,620 feet long and 40 feet wide. It opened for travel in 1834 and was burned by Union troops during the Civil War to prevent the crossing of Confederate troops who were then approaching Wrightsville in 1863. This bridge stood on 27 stone piers and was the first bridge built on the piers that now stand empty between the two remaining bridges. This bridge had a railroad track across, but steam engines were prohibited from crossing. Horse or mule pulled across the rail cars. This bridge cost $128,728 to build. On Sunday, June 28, 1863, there occurred the most momentous and spectacular event in the long and interesting history of Columbia. The Confederate Army had made an excursion into southern Pennsylvania, intending to reach, if possible, Harrisburg, the state capital, and Philadelphia, the metropolis. Their proposed route lay through York, Wrightsville, and over the Columbia Bridge. For several days previous to June 28th, 
there was a continuous stream of teams and people coming over the bridge. As the rebel army advanced into the counties west of the river, the people became panic-stricken. They loaded their most prized possessions on their large farm wagons, and driving their cattle and riding their horses, made their way to the bridge and to Lancaster and Chester counties. The farmers came over in teams, but there were many thousands who came on foot and carried their children and personal belongings. The fugitives congested all the roads leading to and from the bridge, but very few stayed in Columbia, but went on to stay with friends or relatives to the east. The route through Columbia was up Bridge Street to Commerce, to Walnut, to Fourth, and then out the Lancaster Pike, which at that time started at Fourth and Walnut Streets. Companies of home guards were hastily organized and armed. They were composed of older men and young boys and others who were not already on the battlefront. A company of boys from Millersville Normal School under James P. Wickersham, the, the principal, marched to Columbia and they remained there for several days helping to guard the bridge. Almost everyone in Columbia buried or hid their silverware, their gold watches and other valuables. All horses which were always seized by the enemy in time of war were spirited away to distant parts. On the afternoon of June 28, 1863, the people of Columbia were in a state of excitement such as they had never seen before, nor have they been since. On that Sunday afternoon, a brigade of Confederate troops under Early of General Gordon's division reached Wrightsville and they engaged the light hundred poorly trained Union troops under General Frick, who had been in command of the Union defenses in Wrightsville. Frick was driven across the bridge to Columbia and the west end of the bridge was barricaded with cars filled with iron ore. In the meantime, a party of carpenters were making Herculean efforts to blow up two spans of the bridge, the object being to defend the rest, but as they were using black powder, and not having dynamite, the scheme failed and the floor of the bridge remained intact. The rebels having taken possession of Wrightsville, the order was given by General Couch, who commanded the division of the Susquehanna, to burn the bridge and to prevent the Confederate Army from crossing the river. John Q. Denny, who at that time was in the oil business along Strickler's Run, assisted by having Jacob Rich deliver two barrels of oil to the bridge. The oil was put on and these two men, Denny and Rich, applied the matches and soon the structure was a mass of flames. This is part of the transcript from the broadcaster newspaper. Again, the only pictures are by artists. Photography was only coming into its own in the 1860s. The burning of the second bridge was the largest fire ever seen in Colombia. An attempt was made to save part of the span after it had burned sufficiently to prevent the Confederate Army from crossing. The Columbia Fire Department was pressed into service. Lines of hose were laid into the bridge. The fire had been started nearly halfway out on the bridge. The wind was coming up the river, fanning and spreading the flames towards each end. It became impossible for the firemen to stay on the bridge as the smoke was very, very dense and drew through the chimney-like opening. At the Wrightsville end of the structure, men of the Confederate Army made an attempt to stop the fire, which was in vain, and the whole bridge was consumed, burning all night and part of the next day, and so span after span fell into the river below, then floated away like so many burning ships. Many of the spans were still burning when they lodged on the dam, and some struck a spot where water was flowing over the dam and then continued downriver. The entire length of the shoreline was lined with anxious people who remained throughout the night watching this great configuration and also watching the many piles of lumber along the shore when it was feared that the fire would spread to the lumber yards and destroy them all. The bridge was sacrificed to the god of war, but the objective was gained and the rebel invasion of Pennsylvania was stopped at the Susquehanna. Several days later, the great battle was fought at Gettysburg, but that and also the skirmish beyond Wrightsville are both matters of natural history. The burning of the bridge was a sad loss to the Columbia Bank and Bridge Company, and although it was ordered burned by the military authorities, the U.S. government has never, up to the present time, reimbursed the bank 
though bills have been introduced in Congress by each succeeding representative. A year later, in July 6, 1864, a new company was organized by the following Philadelphia men. Joshua Bacon, Wister Morris, Thomas A. Scott, a former Columbian, Joseph B. Myers, Edward C. Knight, H.J. Lombard, and Edmund Smith. This new company bought from the bank the piers, franchise rights, and all other property pertaining to the bridge. The bill of sale being dated July 13, 1864, and from this time on, the bank and the bridge were separate. This is part of the transcript aforementioned. We're watching the burning of the bridge from the Wrightsville side. The empty piers of the second bridge after the burning. The third bridge was built on the same piers as the second bridge and was also a covered bridge. Built at a cost of $400,000, it was 40 feet wide and 5,390 feet long. Two iron spans were put into the center of the bridge in case of fire. This bridge opened in 1869 and was destroyed by a cyclone in 1896. Note the canal basin with boats and railroad cars, also the piles of coal to the left center of the picture. During the four years succeeding the destruction of the Columbia Bridge in 1863, the community was without direct railroad connection with Wrightsville and the ferry boat business, which had been languishing since the opening of the first bridge in 1814, again came to life and carried many passengers, freight, and mail across the river. In the fall of 1867, the Columbia Bridge Company issued some new stock, which was readily purchased and prepared to build a new bridge. Actual construction was started in April 1868 when extra railroad cars were laid along the river shore to unload the vast quantities of lumber necessary for the work. Flat boats were built to transport stone and a large number of stone masons and laborers were put to work to repair the piers which had been damaged in the fire. Meanwhile, a host of carpenters were working on the shore cutting, framing, and making uh, and marking all the timbers in preparation for the raising. The first span was erected during the last week of April, and the remaining spans were finished on an average of one every two weeks. The third bridge consisted of 29 spans, weatherboarded on the sides and shingled on the roof. It was 5,390 feet long. The architect of the bridge, Having in mind the last fire, put two iron spans in the middle so as to save at least half in case of fire. The bridge cost about $400,000 and it was finished and formally opened for traffic January 4, 1869. 
Ten years after the building of this bridge, the structure was sold by the Columbia Bridge Company to the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Strange to say, there is at the present sighting, 1933, one man living in Columbia and possibly the only one living anywhere who worked on the construction of this bridge 65 years ago. This venerable carpenter, long since retired, is George Nisley, over 90 years old, who resides on Walnut Street. For 27 years, the third bridge carried traffic, railroad trains, teams, droves of cattle and foot passengers, and there are many in the older generation who have walked or driven through its dark spans. At 1 a.m. on the morning of September 29, 1896, a terrific hurricane swept up the river from the south. The force of this storm was so great that it swept the bridge from its piers, making of it a total wreck. Fortunately, at the time of the storm, there was no one crossing, and while no lives were lost, the property damage was great. The morning after the storm, at the same spot where Columbia had seen its largest fire, it now viewed its largest wreck. Most of the remains lay in the river just above the piers, but there were whole sections of the roof blown as far up the river as the Henry Clay Furnace, which was just below Chickie's Rock. The lumber from the bridge was all salvaged by rivermen and sold for various purposes. A man named Schof set up a sawmill at the foot of the Locust Street, and he saw the large timbers into boards, and many a building was built from the lumber of the old bridge. This is part of the transcript from the broadcaster newspaper. There were still piles of coal in the canal basin when this picture was taken. The first section of the third bridge stayed on the first pier of the Columbia side. Notice the men standing on the top of the ruins. The first section of the third bridge fell off the first pier as seen from the Wrightsville side.
The fourth bridge was of steel construction and built in 21 working days. It was opened for travel in 1897, built at a cost of $455,000. It was 5,300 feet long. This bridge was designed to carry automobiles on the top deck and trains on the bottom, but was never completed. In 1963, it was finally dismantled. After the destruction of the third bridge, all three having been destroyed differently, flood, fire, and wind, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company took immediate steps to erect with different material a new bridge. This time, instead of the old type wooden covered bridge, open steel trusses were used. The chief engineer of the work was F.F. Dumont, who planned and erected the new span. The plans called for a double deck bridge the lower floor to be used for railroad trains and the upper deck for vehicular and foot traffic. Contracts for the structural iron were given late in 1896 to the Midvale Iron Works and the Pencoid Iron Works. Early in 1897, work was started on repairing of the piers. Many of the top stones had been swept off by the superstructure. A number of large flatboats were built to carry the materials, and many stonemasons and laborers worked with speed to top out the piers preparatory to the actual erection of the steel. During April 1897, carloads of structural ironwork were arriving daily and being piled along the shore in what is now River Park. The same thing was occurring at Wrightsville as the bridge, like most others, was built from both ends at once. This is part of the transcript for mention. This is a view of construction starting on the Columbia side. Meantime, here is a scene of construction on the Wrightsville side. This bridge was started from both sides of the river and is nearing completion in the middle. The equipment at right center is a small dredge used to open the channel for the ferry boats. The material that was brought up by the dredge was loaded into the barge in the center of the picture and was hauled to another location.
You can tell which side of the river the picture was taken from by the piers. The angle side is facing upriver. They placed guards on the bridge during World War I, so how much has changed in all these years? The cars are waiting for the train to exit the bridge so they could cross. The building on the left side is the Pennsylvania Railroad Roundhouse, and the large building in the background is the old Columbia Laundry and Machine Company building still standing.
Steamboat Mary in the front and Henry in the rear docked at Wrightsville. This engine and tender was placed on the bridge to give added weight because of the ice. Automobile seen crossing the railroad bridge. Here they are starting to dismantle the railroad bridge. The fifth bridge, named the Veterans Memorial Bridge, is of cement arch construction and runs between Hellam Street in Wrightsville and Chestnut Street, Columbia. Built at a cost of $2,484,000, it opened for traffic in 1930 and is still used today and known as Route 462. This is the material staging area on the Columbia side. This giant cement mixer was used in the construction.
The steel reinforced sections for the arches were prefabricated, then set in place to have the form built around it. Then the cement was poured into the form. Wrightsville staging area for the raw materials for the building of the bridge. This is some of the steel reinforcing bars used in the construction. Some views of the Columbia side toll houses.
This is Columbia from the air. Note the small section of the Pennsylvania Railroad Roundhouse still standing at the lower center of the picture. Just above the center of the picture is the Opera House. The dignitaries at the dedication ceremony. This is traffic on opening day. The Wrightsville side toll houses. The large building on the left center of the picture was the Hotel Wilson. Wrightsville and the bridge from the air. Thank you. 
Here are some statistics about the fifth bridge. The width of the river is one mile. The bridge length, 7,500 feet. The roadway is 38 feet wide. The sidewalk is six feet in width. There are 28 spans and 20 girder spans. The amount of concrete used was 101,000 cubic yards. There is over 7,991,000 pounds of steel used in the construction. To cover the pavement, over 597,000 blocks of asphalt was used. Five million board feet of lumber was used in construction, and the total weight of the bridge is 425 million pounds. And finally, it cost over $2.5 million to build. The sixth bridge carrying Route 30 across the Susquehanna between Columbia and Wrightsville was named the Wrights Ferry Bridge and was built approximately 100 yards north of the first bridge location. It is 5,643 feet long, 75 feet wide, spanning across 45 piers. The cost to build this bridge was $2.4 million and it was completed October 20th, 1972. Note the Route 30 bridge can be seen in the center of this picture. The last four photographs were taken in August of 2002.
You have just witnessed approximately 180 pictures of history. We hope you enjoyed it.